You did? <laughs> acai berry? Okay, you were probably the only one on the island that knew what acai berry is because it wasn't marketed. It didn't get out into the, um, the larger populations. It's, not, it's a superfood, and it's got all the antioxidants and all this stuff. Now people are dredging it in chocolate, and I just had some chocolate-covered acai berry the other day. It was so good. So can you create one? Would you be able to go around Hawaii telling people that um, whatever your new product, your new type of kale is, uh, is a new superfood and be able to market it? Could you create a market? That's the best way to make money in Hawaii, creating your own market. Never get involved in one that already exists. We'll talk about this on the business side of the class. There's kind of like a, there's a curve to a life of a product, no matter what it is. And it starts down here, and then it moves up, and then it matures, and then it falls off. This area down here where it's still flat and hasn't quite picked up, that's where you want to pick up that market. That's where you want to get in is down here. You never want to get in on the upside of a market because it's just the potential. It's going to eventually mature and you're going to crash off. So never get involved in a market that's not on that first, um, you know, just coming out of the gate, okay, type of a product. We'll go into that a lot when we talk about marketing. Um, is the crop market saturated and why? Well, a saturated market might be because lots of people like the product. That's fine. Can you then sell a lettuce that's purple or something that people are like, ooh, it's just like every other lettuce, but I, for whatever reason, you've got my eye and I want to buy it. So if it's saturated, can you get in on it and can you create your own market in a saturated market? I suggest you don't even play that game. Get in on that ground floor of product um, development. Ask yourself, where is your market? There's a lot of people in Hawaii that grow products, especially making added value products, and nobody in Hawaii buys those products. They ship them off to Japan, they ship them off to Korea, they ship them off to California, and they go to people that are willing to pay an incredible amount of money for products from Hawaii. These people exist. Has anybody been to Japan and then wandered around looking for Hawaii on things? I've, I've been there and you, you, you look for Hawaii and then you look at the prices of things from Hawaii. If it says Hawaii on it, it's like double the price. And it's, it's because of all the loopholes they say that it takes to get those products over there, whatever. They're just marking it up all the way across, okay? So um, can you say, I know a woman that does dried persimmons and then she sends them off to Japan and she undercuts the people out in Japan because she's able to grow them much cheaper than they are there. So, that's where her market is. It's not here, you don't, have to, you don't have to do it here. We all love that you would try to play the local game, but not necessarily a requirement to make money in Hawaii. Um, is your market seasonal? I know a gentleman in Oregon who grows Christmas trees. He sits on his butt all year long and does nothing. I swear, he does nothing. He hangs out with his wife, and they go hiking, and they go vacationing. And then for three months out of the year, he works 80-hour weeks, chopping, preparing, and shipping Christmas trees. He sells them all off, sends them all over the country. Some of them actually come to Hawaii. And, you know when he's, and, and, and uh, the day after Christmas, you know what he does? He starts the first day of his new vacation. He counts his money. He waits for the order checks to come in. And then he does a little bit of finances. He's done by January. And then he just, he's, that's what he does. It's fantastic. Of course, you have to go out and replant and do all that other thing. But after year five, he has enough money that he pays people to do it for him. So he just sits there, pays people to go plant the trees, pays people to chop them down, pays people to package them up. And then, and then he does the finances. That's it. So is it a market seasonal? And does that work for you? What percentage of the market can you control? Definitely ask yourself this question in Hawaii specifically. If you're growing beets, could you control the beet market? Certainly possible. Not too many people grow beets. They grow really, really well. You just got to watch out for your root, not nematodes. And if you're able to be a successful beet farmer, um, you can make a pretty penny, especially if you're growing for sugar beet and then you do sugar. Um, any kind of local produced sugar, whether it be sugar beet or sugar cane, uh, gets sold like that. It's real fast because all the hotels and all this stuff will actually buy it for making um, high-end desserts and that kind of thing. 
OK? So what percentage? Let's do a little bit of research on some crops, all right? Pull up that, uh, that uh, link page I gave you and look for that Hawaiian parad paradise coat. WordPress, blah, blah, blah. And see if you can click on that, see if that works. No, no, no. Where's that? Oh, you, you don't have your email. The thing I emailed you guys. Everybody got this? Except for the folks who didn't do the requirement for the email. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I got to move on. Everybody's on this? OK. So it's really hard to see this with the uh, projector. I could, I could tell from the back. Uh, but you got it in front of you. So this is a really great uh, write-up that somebody did based upon the crop statistics from the 2007 census for agriculture. And it basically talks about uh, all the different types of crops that uh, are grown in Hawaii, uh, their quantities, and their acreage, and how much was yielded in the year 2007. Okay. You start at the top with uh, forages. That would be alfalfa and hay. It uh, looks like there's five farms in Hawaii covering 89 acres, and they grow 267 tons of dried material. That's a, that's a whole lot of alfalfa. Do you guys know what alfalfa goes for? You get a pretty penny out here in Hawaii He's feeding horses. People with horses and money will pay anything for top quality local alfalfa. So um, to drop a little seed in your head as far as what crops that you might want to grow in Hawaii, that's why I'm going through this list. Okay? So we can go into vegetables. Um, I know, like you look at artichokes, looks like nobody in the census claimed that they were making money on artichokes. That's a little different now. There's somebody out in Volcano that's doing it on five acres. Uh, she makes a pretty good penny off of it. But as you go down, you have asparagus, snap beans, Chinese cabbage, blah, blah, blah. Keeps going all the way down. Down to turnips. We have fruits and nuts. Some people are growing apples. I got some apples from the uh, Waimea Farmer's Market the other day, these little sweet things. Oh, they were so good. <laughs> they were the best apples ever. I put it in my salad. Um, look at all those people growing avocados for profit. Look at all those people growing papayas for profit. Does that look like a type of market you want to get involved in? You want to grow papayas? <laughs> Everybody's growing papayas. Why would you grow papayas? So the reason why we're going through this what list, um, it means they just don't have data. It means that, yeah, they weren't able to populate any data in there. Yeah, sweet potato and that kind of thing. So as you go through this list, you realize that some people are growing some things and some people are growing others, right? Obviously, these things do grow in Hawaii. So here's a list of things that grow in Hawaii. And here's a list of things that shows flooded markets and markets that people uh, might be able to get involved in. So for grapefruit. Grapefruit might be a good market for you uh, if you're able to grow citrus in rocky soils with really nice drainage like you guys got, right? So you can tell that there's only 18 acres of it going right now, and I bet you not much of it is actually on Big Island. And if you were to get into the hotels providing fresh grapefruits for breakfasts uh, at the resorts, and you're paying, they're paying top dollar for whatever you ask for it because you're able to give them a good, decent product, because you're the only person on the island selling it. It's the whole state of Hawaii, correct. So, ginger, 31 farms, 51 acres? Mm, probably not. There's probably a lot more than that. So look really closely at these numbers. They are U.S. Census data. People like to lie to the government. And you can tell what kind of farmers like to lie to the government, right? So the papaya farmers, mostly immigrant, right? Um, don't like to fib and don't like to give wrong data because they don't want to get in trouble. And then you have the folks that have been on the island forever, and they're like, yeah, screw you guys. I'm going to tell you what I want to tell you. So you got to look at it really closely, right? So pineapples, like look at pineapples. Come on. Harvested, 19 acres. It's a lot more than that. What's going on with that? Yeah. yeah, that's that's 
the companies not claiming correctly on the census. Okay, but you don't want to grow papaya, or you don't want to grow papaya. You don't want to grow pineapple. It's a flooded market. It's obvious that, that pineapple doesn't do well in Hawaii at, the, at this given moment. And really, you guys want to do subsistence more than anything. Um, at least have something that you can actually feed your family with. You know, papaya, uh, pap papayas and pineapples. You know, so this is just a list of ideas for crops. Okay, so think about this. A lot of them will be field crops. Um, something like persimmons. Persimmons get a lot of money per pound, especially if it's processed. So, um, you know, just go through this li list and maybe something in this list will trigger an idea to use a crop for your, uh, for your plant, okay? That's all I'm doing there. I'm gonna click on this next one here. Um, the Sitar Hawaii Free Pubs, this is the 12 fruits. 12 fruits. Please bring this up. Got it? Yeah, close it up. Is everybody here? Hey, this is a wonderful book that was just published very, very recently by Ken Love. Um, Richard Bowen, I don't know him. Uh, Kent Fleming, I do know him. These guys, at least the, 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 first, the first and last one, these are the fruit gurus of Hawaii. These are the guys that know more about growing fruit trees than any person I've ever met. Um, and they actually had a great idea to try to stimulate new markets in Hawaii as far as fruit trees go. They did a lot of research as far as 12 potential fruit trees that um, have been known to grow well in Hawaii and could certainly cre have a market if they were able to create a market for it. So what they did was they, they actually planted out 12 of these trees and did experiments uh, to find out which ones produced the best in the specific environment that they had them in. Now, take this information with a grain of salt scientifically because they are only planting a limited amount of trees in a very s specific area. So they're not like planting, you know, um, jabong trees all over the island and then looking at that data they actually only planted it on, on one plot and they only used a couple samples so grain of salt but certainly some some valid data here um, let's go through it real fast I don't want to go through it too much but let's look at this list on the table of contents and here's the list of the 12 uh, fruits that they, rec they they tested they certainly don't recommend all of them and I'll get to that the caramoyas figs uh, you got everything down from laquat, kumquat, um, poha berries, pomegranates, some limes, apricot. So here's a list of ones that they had done research on that might be a potential market. They then indicated, uh, they basically gave a write-up of the cultivars, a description of each one of these, um, where they would grow, in what environments they would grow the best, how to propagate them how to pollinate them, and this was an effort to try to stimulate people to <clears throat> read this material and then go plant these trees and have full information on how to do that. Um, they also give some, uh, some, what do you call it, recipes and stuff to, to be able to use it. Basically, they're trying to stimulate some interest in these products. Take a really, really close look at this one, guys. I'm hard up on figs, man. You can make a ton of money on figs in Hawaii. So take a really, really close look at this write-up um, and how to, how to grow them. And maybe that might be a great product for you. That's highly recommended on my part. Uh, a lot of these products and these fruit trees are for um, Asian markets and other markets that <clears throat> are for emerging populations in Hawaii. So what they're doing is recognizing that people are coming from other places to Hawaii. They like these types of fruits and that there is a market, but nobody's filling it. So that's why they have most of these up there. So I'm going to keep going through here. I mean, here's all the descriptions, but I want to get to down to this last page or this last section. <clears throat> these are all like serenum cherry and stuff. Okay. I want to get to whoop, whoop, cost of production page which is page 48. 
Here's the data that they were able to compile for these. Why are you acting funny, computer? OK. So they have all the 12 different types. The number of plants that they monitored, here's the lack of scientific data, one, three, two, OK. Um, they recorded the pounds of yield per plant of annual marketable yield, the average market price that they were able to get uh, for their product, the gross revenue, how much money were they able to make off of gr after growing uh, for gross, total growing costs, it was $79 to grow one tree. Total harvesting cost cost $238 to harvest that tree. Total variable cost $286. And then the gross margin only giving you $239 profit and 35 cents per tree. Everybody see number two? You got to remember, Ken Love grew these trees. <laughs> he knows how to make the most maximum yield. Your numbers might be different because of your experiences with fruit trees. So just remember that as well. These were done by masters. So Ken was able to get a profit margin of $2,000 per tree. Anywhere where you're pulling profit is fine. You start getting into these negative numbers, the raspberry, poha berry, getting into negative numbers, probably because of the picking and processing. So. There it is. Here's some more ideas to grow crops in Hawaii. OK? Moving on. Got to keep going. I'm going to go to this uh, list full record Hawaii. Everybody see this one that I'm s this is where I'm going? I don't know what the title of it is. It's probably the third one down. I kind of I tend to keep them in slightly chronological order. OK. This is a link to the USDA's website. And this is the agriculture library where they have, shh, leave me alone. They, uh, they have a great website that you can actually put in uh, search keys, uh, keyword searches, and uh, come up with some really important papers uh, that were written specifically for Hawaii. So. What I did was, I think I searched Hawaii. <laughs> and it talks about, um, ba, ba, ba. it talks about um, several different types of, as you go through this list, it talks about several different types of crops that uh, have been grown in Hawaii. <coughs> and how it resulted, and how the results came out. So it talks a little bit about corn and corn borer. Um, not really the best website to look at. But I just wanted to show you that the USDA has a place that you can search for crop names. Uh, and you might be able to find some useful write-ups that somebody's already done the work for you. Uh, you might be able to get some data for your market research from here. Okay. All right, what's the next hyperlink here? Uh, the bees, the bee project. Here's an idea. How far away is the MacNut farm from you guys in Ponyeva? It's what, at the end of the road, right? What better place to grow, to, to have, make a, have a honey farm than right next to a perfectly free uh, mac macadamia nut source. So, um, Gerald actually has a great idea to start up some some great uh, bee projects over where you guys are at. So, you can make a lot of money off honey. You can make a lot of money off beeswax. You can make a lot of money um, off uh, giving your your bee services out for pollination. The only thing I got to tell you is, um, if you're going to do bees out in Paniava area. And you're going to use, is that Mauna Loa right, right there? If you're going to use their, their sources of pollen, um, do your research and find out what kind of insecticides they use. Um, do they do varilla mite 
uh, prevention, do your research, know your neighbors. If, you, if your bees are going to your neighbor's house, you need to be in communication with them. and Because they will give you that information. They have to give you that information. What are they spraying on their crops? They have to let you know So as their neighbor. So huge potential for a market. Not only that, but you can just kind of do bees on the side. There's a lot, plenty of people that do bees on the side and make an extra 10 grand a year. Um, they, just, they just kind of go out there and they sell their product out and they get it all jarred up and they, they, they get a market for it. And there's plenty of market for local Hawaiian honey. Especially if you can get your honey from here to Oahu. There's a ton of money to be made over there on honey. Okay? So, bees. Great idea for you guys. What's the next one? Ah, Mac nuts. All right, Mac nuts. Obviously, there is some type of a market in Hawaii. Some of the older farmers will actually say that there it's like a dead market. Some people will say that it's really hard to make a living at it. Um, the newer farmers are actually showing that they can make a, a ton of money at it currently. So let's take a look at the final season estimates given out by uh, USDA for macadamia nut production in Hawaii. Um, yeah, let me show you something here. Let me, as they used to say, let me show you something. Ah, the historical data. Good stuff. So it goes all the way back to 1946. And it talks about acreage, yield per acre, production, farm price, and farm value. Look at those numbers as they grow over time, right? So from the 40s into the 70s, you had getting into the 9 uh, to 10,000 acres. Late 70s, which and early 80s is kind of regarded as the height of Hawaiian macadamia nut farming, at least that's when farmers were making the most money uh, with the product. A lot of it had to do with the lack of labor um, laws <laughs> on the island, but uh, eventually the man caught up with them, right? But they were able to persevere, okay? Um, in the 70s, we, so we're at 10,000, and then we make this jump to 13, 15 into the 80s. So when we hit that 15 marker, uh, farm value is getting 26,000, and it doesn't stop. It keeps going up. It keeps going up. Keep going. And then in the 90s, we had a decline. It started to go down and started to go down. But let's go back to the heyday when most farmers were able to make the most amount of money, at least this is the time period that um, the world market started really grabbing onto a Hawaiian macadamia nut. So at this period, there's 17,000 acres and the farm values are at about 26,000. <clears> Let's go to today. These numbers are actually surpassing those numbers during the heyday, right? Um, 38,000 is really close to, what was the maximum, 44 and 89? That's pretty darn close to the highest amount that a farmer was able to make during the history of Mexico. Yeah, uh, right, so we have cost, we actually have labor regulations and the government telling us who we can hire and how to hire them and we have to give them bathrooms and we have to give them places to, to rest and all that yeah. stuff. So with all that and $5 a gallon for gas, right. You can make a whole ton of money. The market has not changed. It has not gone anywhere. It's it's just it's it's creeping up and it keeps going up and up and up. I, I heard though that China um, is taking over a million acres of mac nuts. Sure, they have a million acres everywhere. Are they going to export it here? No, they're not going to get into our market. So this is our market. We can create our own and we can make it even bigger. So uh, it's no fear for us. Now, if you're in California and you're a, a, a purchaser, um, that actually might be, you might be more prone to buy it from China. But then again, you're asking yourself, have I been to that farm? Do I know? And these guys out here in Hawaii who have been growing it, and I know it's a good product, and they, I know what kind of things they use.
because they have to follow U.S. Reg regulations as far as fertilizers and E. coli and all that stuff. So, um, especially when you're talking about processing. So most people would, would buy from U.S. Uh, versus Chinese markets any day of the week, no matter what the price. So, Mac nuts, great idea. Write a business plan on Mac nuts, and uh, you can actually sustain yourself doing that. Of course, you're going to have to do some stuff on the side, but uh, you can make a pretty penny at this point in the market with Mac nuts. If you throw a little chocolate over each one and charge five bucks for a package of four, you, you've just made it into the market, man. Okay. Okay. Keep going. Which one's this one? Fruit and flowers? I gave this to you already. Did you read it over? Or should I go through it? You didn't read it over. So, it has a uh, list of the commodity, and over the last boop, 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 five years, uh, what the prices and trends have been for each market. So when you want to do a business plan for nursery, and that seems like something that you want to do, uh, is my camera going okay? Do we? Okay. Um, if that's something that you want to do, and it looks like something you want to make money at, um, let's use this data for your market analysis. Okay. Do, 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 do. It breaks down specific kinds of cut flowers, birds of paradise, anthuriums, ginger, red, and all others. It does a really good job of breaking this stuff down. So this is another idea. I strongly recommend that maybe somebody in this class does a nursery project for their business plan. Why? Because you can make a lot of money. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I keep stressing the nursery market because that's actually where I first started in and I watched how much money was to be made and then I watched the environmental implications of it and then I got out. But if that's not a huge concern for you and you just want to make a ton of money, the nursery is a great way to go. Okay. On the same theme, what better way to make money in Hawaii and on DHHL land than to have a nursery that sells native plants? What better way to get a grant to have a group of native farmers have a co-op of, of nurseries for native plants. You guys could easily get together, write a proposal, and get a business grant for that. Like that. I couldn't see a better group of people that would have more luck in getting a grant than a group of native farmers who want to sell native plants. Plain and simple. Somebody please write a business plan for a native um, plant nursery. So here's a list of native plants. And this is a database that was put together by CTAR, and it is an incredible database. Uh, it has everything listed from the uh, Latin name, and then it also has the Hawaiian name, um, and then you can actually view a profile of each one of these. And usually, sometimes it has pictures, this one doesn't, but it gives a good idea of what it is, um, some of the history behind it, yada, yada, yada. So, if you were to get into native plants, you would maybe want to focus on ones that were Big Island specific. You may want to focus on ones that uh, serve a certain purpose for native groups, or if you just want to do it for um, landscaping or for whatever purposes, get involved in with uh, government buildings. Government buildings, and if anything goes up, especially also hotels and that kind of thing, um, anything goes up, native farmers, uh, native uh, plant. Um, specialists go in there first before the landscapers do. They're more prone to get those native plants because you could, you could, they're easy to sell. Um, just tell people that they belong here and those don't. It's an easy sell. Okay? So, and also, um, they usually have a best, better time with disease. They have a better time. Uh, also, with propagation is usually very easy because they will propagate uh, within this environment better than anywhere else. Okay, native plants. What is this one? Ah, it's another list of native plants, rare and unusual plants. Um, this is done by Lion Arboretum, and it is a huge uh, write-up that talks about a bunch of things that aren't really all as important as index of plant names, which I think is at the bottom. And the rare, unusual plants, uh, page 18 to 52. Let's go there. Okay. 
So 